This episode of Untold Stories is sponsored by Ledin.io. You'll hear more about them later on in this episode. What is up, everyone? I am Charlie Shrem, and you are listening and watching a super freaking special edition of Untold Stories, where twice a week together, we get to dive deep with some of crypto's most influential leaders to really understand how this movement came to be, where we came from, and where the hell we're going. This is so crazy. We're, we're recording now out of Nightbird Studios underneath the Sunset Marquee Hotel in Los Angeles. You see this beautiful piano, microphones. We're here with Vinny Lingham. Vinny, thank you so much for coming back. Hey, An Charlie, great story. to be back with you. This is, this is, I'm just so excited to be here right now. This is great. I know. This is, um, you know, you are in been, Hollywood. Charlie, I know. We're, we're in Hollywood. Hollywood. We're, we got we're crypto Sunset. guys in Hollywood. How cool is that? Making, making movies. You know, you've done so much. You've done so much in the space. And I was just thinking the other day how, you know, going back to 2012, when you had started Gift, there was really no way to sell Bitcoin or to do anything um, as it relates to our whole economy. And I remember a story being in, I may have told you this before, I was like in Banana Republic and I needed to buy a belt and I just had some Bitcoin on me and I was able to go into Gift and buy a gift card with my Bitcoin in the app and be able to buy what I needed to buy. And that, you know, in 2012 was such a big, I look back, it's almost 10 years ago and the whole industry and you, and you're still in it and we'll talk about everything you've done, but how do you feel that you're still kind of in this industry 10 years later? It's kind of been the fastest industry ever. Like 10 years feels like nothing, literally. I, I can't actually, I, I mean, I, I remember buying my own, my first Bitcoins. I mean, like, and ridiculously low prices, obviously, yeah. and back in those days, but I had to buy it from a friend because there was like Coinbase wasn't really up and running yet. And there wasn't a way yet. To, you, 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 you know, that was back in the days when Mt. Gox was still around. And, you know, I was like, well, I actually had an account there, I guess, at some point. I never actually funded it because I was like, who are these sketchy guys in yeah. the middle of nowhere? I'm not putting money with these guys. And so, you know, it, it was back in the old days and there weren't on ramps and off ramps for fiat. It's, it was all seen as like, you know, drug and money laundering money. And, you know, yeah. like the, the, the stigma attached to Bitcoin was so bad that when we added Bitcoin at Gift, I got a lot of blowback from some investors and, you know, advisors and like, don't touch this. You're going to get shut down. Look, we got arrested at Silk Road. Oh, yeah. I'm like, we're selling gift cards. We're complying with like FinCEN guidance on uh, amounts. You couldn't spend more than $2,000 or 500 bucks on a transaction. And so we had all these limits that was, that, that was in place. And so I felt comfortable doing it. But it's, and there was still yeah. demand. There was still a lot of demand because Huge. the demand for Bitcoin and being able to use it came from within. The first exchanges that were built were to service the people that, that because the Bitcoin faucets that were giving out free Bitcoin were running out of Bitcoin. They yeah. were People wanted more of it, yeah. not to like, oh, this thing is going to be worth so much down the road, but they want to interact with it, be a part of it, join, you know, be on the forums, talk to people, buy things with it. And that's what the first exchanges, everything, you know, all the businesses were started that, that had started and launched my bit instant back then your gift were were businesses that were really started to service the whole industry from within and now it's changed now i mean you're a you're a, a gp at multi coin capital you have you're you're doing so many things uh other than civic that you've launched in 2017 you're a shark at the south african version of shark tank you have you actually wrote an awesome book. It's great. Well, usually when I'm doing the show on Zoom, I can like not have my paper in front of me. It's uh, you wrote a book called uh, "I'm in Essential Advice for Entrepreneurs," and you're still investing. You're still you're still on top of on top of the space, constantly tweeting about things like Solana and your price predictions. As bullish and bearish as they've been, they've always been, and like it's hard to hear sometimes. They've been somewhat accurate and it's like, you know, going back to listening to our other episode together, you were listening to it and it's really great. And I was thinking about this the other day is investing in is investing now the same as investing in crypto in like 2016. And what I mean by that, you know, Ethereum and you had all these layer ones, but now it's kind of we're back at that in in terms of what are people looking for? You have different types of entrepreneurs, you have passionate ones, missionary ones. Is that whole industry kind of changing? Well, it's a very broad question. I, I think that my approach to investing has definitely changed over the years. Um, it's It's gone away from looking at ideas and then focusing more on people. 
And I, I, I've made good money backing good ideas, but backing great people, I've made a lot more money. And so when I look at, um, you know, like Solana, you just mentioned, when I met Anatoly, uh, you know, he came into my office. It was an introduction from a, a CEO that I invested in, who's also a really great guy. And he said, hey, you need to meet Anatoly. And he's building this, you know, this, this platform for uh, smart contracting and crypto. This is 2018, bubble had crashed. You know, everything was in a little bit, you know, of a downswing and people were getting worried, worried. And I could tell that this guy was one of the smartest guys I ever met. Uh, it took me about 15 minutes to realize that because, my, you know, the skepticism goes out the moment, you know, some guy with, you know, yeah. the name Anatoly walks in promising it. <laughs> yeah, you're like, where, <laughs> it's like there there are are, things this are Russian mathematician <laughs> guy coming in. And then I was like, okay, what, what what's his story? And, you know, uh, we, we just hit it off. I mean, we had a fantastic conversation. I was like, okay, I'm coming on board. Like, I'll bring Multicoin in and uh, led that round and got, um, uh, you know, got in as an advisor at Solana and really helped them in the early days to, you know, focus and build up to where they are. And now it's like, you know, in, in retrospect, I mean, it was it's obvious, right? It's always obvious in hindsight. But like, at the time, it wasn't an obvious, it wasn't an obvious uh, bet at all. It was more about, I think the obvious bet was that, that you know, Anatoly would be successful regardless whether it's Solana or something else. And I just want to be sort of close to him and, and, and backing oh, him. Oh, that's a very interesting. Yeah. So I, I, for me, it was backing Anatoly. And then I met Raj and I loved Raj as well. And we got along and we had a whole bunch of like sushi dinners and lunches in San Francisco on a regular basis. And, you know, just got close to the team. So Solana is a great example of, of backing the people, not the idea. And the idea happened to be brilliant as well. I mean, you know, it was we were very ambitious at the time, given the constraints in blockchain technology. And uh, if it worked, you know, which again was not obvious, it would be big. Uh, th th there's uh, there's one other person who I met like this, who is um, Juan Benet from uh, from Filecoin. When I met Juan, I was oh, like, yeah. this guy's total genius, totally gets it. Uh, you know, wasn't an obvious bet at the time. I mean, I invested in Filecoin in 2014. I mean, yeah. it was like three years before the ICO. It was early stage. It was still it was Protocol Labs. They're building IPFS. And it was a very long-term vision, but you got to back the people. And so, you know, I've got another another one I've just found as well. Like I, I find these like super rare geniuses every three years. It's kind of weird. Like I meet a lot of people, Charlie, and I went yeah. through a lot of people. Yeah. But the 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 one in a billion guy doesn't happen often. What would you say to guy someone? Guy or girl, by the way. <laughs> yeah. What would you say to that person though, who's listening to this show? who's brilliant in, in a specific field or subject, but they don't know what they want to do. They know that they, they do have a higher calling. There's something that they should be doing. Maybe they don't know if they're good enough or what they should do or how they should get to that point. Yeah, those are not the people I want to back necessarily. Huh. And it sounds terrible, but like, you know, if you don't know what you want to do or you, you're uncertain, you're not ready for, you're not ready for the capital that I want to bring in. Um, I'm looking for people who, who, They've got this unique insight that they figured out they're a one in a billion type of entrepreneur and they don't know how, but they know what. So they know what they want to build. They're very clear on what it is, what it's going to look like in three years, five years, 10 years from now, at least in some, in some way, shape or form. But more importantly, they just, they don't have the capital to do it because they haven't created capital in their lives or they haven't worked, you know, they haven't had a success before, et cetera. And they're out raising money and, but the vision that they have is very clear, and the, their ability to execute on that vision is 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 you know uh, is unquestionable. So when I met Anatoly, for example, he had just finished off at Qualcomm in the Advanced Research Projects Division. He'd written you know uh, embedded code for I don't know microchips we're all using today. The guy knows what he's doing. He's like an yeah. extremely skilled individual. And the same applied to Juan and you know what what he had done in crypto and. Uh, you know, it's at Stanford, etc. He he had it, it's not really about like you know uh, credentials and where you studied. It's more about yeah. what you know, right? And it was very clear that the two of them knew it. Uh, another guy is, for example, Jules Urbach from Renda um, Otoy. I mean, Jules is probably one of the most, I would say, smartest people on the planet when it comes to uh, GPU compute, ray tracing, all those things that's happening in in, in the world of three D animation, NFTs, etc. He has a great vision for the metaverse and what he's trying to build out there in the metaverse. Um, and so these are the types of people that you want to meet and just load up capital behind and help them build whatever they're building. Oh, yeah. I forgot that that Facebook yesterday just rebranded themselves as Meta. Exactly. And Jules has been going on about this for a long time. And, yeah. and, and he's had this vision around the metaverse 
And, uh, you know, if you looked at Apple last week, the, um, the Apple presentation, it was basically, uh, they, you know, he was on stage, <laughs> he was on, he was in the video and they showed the Starship Enterprise, which was rendered on render, uh, on the render network using his technologies at Otoy. Uh, and you're like, wow. That's so like, cool. You know, he, he, so these, like, again, I've met three and I, it's probably a few more that I can, I, you know, I, I won't sort of name drop right now, but it's, you know, a few more other people who are just exceptional, but you don't meet them often. I mean, I'm lucky if I come across and, and, and oh, the other thing is like, you want to meet them before they've made it. That's the hard thing, right? Yeah. The, the, the financial opportunity isn't meeting successful people like, Hey, you know, you go meet Elon and like, what are you going to do? <laughs> he doesn't want your money. I don't right? know what to say. Yeah. You yeah. Meet some of these people like, I but nothing. he doesn't want your money. Right. So he's yeah. already made it. Like, so you don't, you want to meet Elon before he's made his first dollar. You want to meet those people, those like, you know, I, I call them um, species changes, right? Like they change the trajectory species of our species. Changes. Yeah. You're you're a, a a shark or a dragon on the South African. You're not that type of, of species. I'm talking more like the human species. No, I know, but <laughs> do you meet, you know, someone someone shows up right there on, you know, you're you're sitting in the chair right on stage, and someone shows up. Can you have the ability within five minutes to tell if that person is like a species changer? So I like that. Species. You know, it's it's it's. I think I can tell in the first fifteen minutes generally. Uh, of an engaged conversation. It's good they do multiple takes of well, the show. Well, the, the reason like is because love. they just stand out above everything else. They, they just literally like stand out. So so think about this, okay? If if we hadn't had a 7 billion human population, would we have found the people we have today in it? Like the Bezos, the Elon Musks of the world. Like if we were at subscale, we had 100 million people, you wouldn't find the exceptionalism at scale. Because like these people only appear one in every 500 million births or one in every 250 million births or whatever that number is. So you've got this like, you know, this need to have as many births as possible in order to find these people. And it's not just genetic, it's a function of genetic and timing and environment. But it's very clear to us as human population scales, we find species changes. We find people that uh, can change the trajectory of our lives on earth, that can create massive amounts of uh, value for humanity. And uh, and I, I think that, you know, in one vein, we're we're struggling because humans are living longer. So the turnover in, in humans is actually a lot lower now because instead of average age of 65 yeah. or 75, the, so the, so the I never thought of it like yeah. that, the turnover. So, so it's a big problem. So if we have population decline, um, it's actually a very bad thing for, for humans because, because more people are living longer and we're having less births, the number keeps creeping up, but we're not, we're not discovering these, you know, these, these species changes in the first 10 years of their adult life or 20 years or whatever it is and getting behind them. And so we, and we have a lot more on the back end between the ages of like 60 to a hundred. Yeah. We, we, I mean, I think we all agree people in this, you know, the eighties to a hundred, they're not going to build anything. They're running our you know, country. They're, yeah. They're, 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 all they're, our countries. they're not going to be able to, you know, take us to space or on a different planet or something. It's just, you know, you have to be more in your productive years. And so we have this problem where the human population growth slowing is going to, you know, it's going to affect us. Now, there is another benefit of having a, a bigger human population. If there's, you know, if, if Elon's a one in a billion, call it that, what does it look like when we have a, find a one in a, one in 10 billion individual? Is it like, is he, a, you know, orders of magnitude more, you know, powerful in terms of what he can do for the human species than Elon or not? What you're describing is is physics and you're talking about randomness and we're talking about, you know, statistics, the, the more, it's, it's statistics. A, it's statistics. If we have it's statistics, the yeah. more... You know, we have a, a bigger, a bigger uh, playing field. We have a larger amount of control. Then we have more of the ability. So we have ten million, you know, ten billion people. Yeah. What do we get out of that? I think and that's this is why how freedom we is get... important. This is why freedom is important because if if, if you have this kid born in a yeah. oppressive society, some part of the world, and he's a oppressed, and like a total genius, a total next level person, and they're oppressed, and they don't, and we can't reach them, we can't find them, then they don't, they don't change the trajectory of our species. And so this is like why freedom is so important on a global scale and why I'm involved in crypto as well. But oh. I, I like I don't know what it looks like to get a 10x version of, of an Elon, but my guess is there probably will be one of those that emerges in our species over the next X number of years. Yeah. But statistically, we may need to get to many more births to find that person. And so, you know, I, I'm very like, I'm excited about what I'm seeing and the fact that these individuals can come out of nowhere. And you find them and they just create immense amounts of value for society over, you know, a couple of, just in, effectively one lifetime, right? 
They're pretty much all working on crypto now, unless they're working on like getting humans into space or time travel or something. It doesn't like only that. have to be crypto. I mean, it, it's someone like it's someone who could come in with. I mean, here's an example: you could find someone who's born in some random part of the world through whatever life experiences and genetic uh, dispositions. They come up with a way to reverse aging, you know, and that changes the trajectory of the entire species. Um, can you imagine like spe species oh. changes are, are, are basically these individuals that change the trajectory of where we're going as a species? Where there have been historical ones like from hundreds of years ago. Oh, I mean even Einstein, right? Yeah, Einstein changed the trajectory of our species, like the Manhattan Project did. Like you know, nuclear weapons changed. It, it, like it changed, you know, nuclear power. Even the printing press. The printing press, Gutenberg. There's lots of these, and and the, what we're finding is we're finding like so. It's interesting because there'll always be these exceptional people, even on smaller scale. Okay, but they, 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 what we're finding is um, they're even more exceptional at, at, at scale. So, and you can look at some autistic people out there who just do these amazing mental calculations, which are just mind boggling. Like I've seen people do like yeah. 50,000 digits of pi and yeah. you know, like it's crazy stuff like that. These people don't, if you only had a million humans on the planet, you wouldn't find a person that could do that. You wouldn't find a person that could do all these different things. And so the size of the population, I think, opens up the possibility to these crazy mad geniuses emerging. A lot of these rare geniuses came out of like a hardship though. Yeah. So if we get to a more like equal and just world, what will be, do you find a lot of people need to have like a fire, like a motivation or passion, like something happened to them or they grew up poor or they came from a place or it could just be a normal it's person. Excuse. Is it, ah, what do because, you mean? Like, because like, I, I've had that. I grew up poor. I grew up in apartheid. I grew up with all these like, Sure. You know, you know, sort of crappy world, first world, <laughs> third world experiences. And I come to America and I'm able to sort of thrive here. But, uh, you know, when I say it's an excuse, it's, uh, it, it's the, like, I am successful because of my past. Mm. But if it wasn't that past, I probably would have still been successful given a different trajectory and I'd mm. have something else. Maybe to even more. M well, maybe, or maybe less. Or but different. I, but I could, uh, but the, the, the point is, it's really easy to put it to your past and say, it's because of that they're successful. But, you could have been successful on another journey as well. So I, I don't think it's like always blaming. So I, the way I explain to people, the way I think about this is, um, you know, when you're going through tough times, it's more like resistance training. Sure. You know, you're building stronger muscles, you're doing, you know, you're you, you waiting through it. It does take time. And it does, like, it does steal from your life force to some extent when you're trying to build up, uh, going through tough times, it does strengthen you. But, you know, Without it, could you have run harder and faster, to your point? Like, could you have been more successful? Yeah. Where would you be if you didn't have the traumatic event? Where would you and, be today? And, and you can't run these experiments in real life. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. So so it's easy for us to just go back and say, you know, it was because of this I'm successful. But, you know, the alternative could have been uh, you put you in the same place. You just don't know. Or even a better place. Yeah. You just don't know. You can't you can't rerun human, you know, life experience life experience. You can't rewrite history until yeah. until we can. Well, that's the whole thing, you know, the year I hear all these terms like metaverse, web three, uh, NFTs yeah. is even becoming now an old thing. Oh, yeah, NFTs is old now. We're doing metaverse stuff now. Yeah, yeah Facebook rebranded as meta. We're yeah. doing crazy stuff. I'm out here in we're in Hollywood and we're doing all meetings with producers and directors and and I'm hearing a lot of the same questions. It's like Charlie. We want to do NFT. We want to be involved in this. What do we do? And and I don't really know how to how an answer in a non gimmicky way. How what would you say to these people? So I would explain to people when you think about NFTs, think about this as a fundamental cultural shift in humanity. Okay, and what I mean by that Call is Shock Yeah, I'm sorry. No, 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 a friend. Oh, uh, so so it's a cultural shift because we've grown up with the culture and and. If you think about a, a Mona Lisa, right? If you put the Mona Lisa in your house, people will be like, you know, obviously flocking there, they want to go see it, et cetera. And you put a fake version of it up, a lithograph, eh, no one gives a shit. <laughs> it's, but what's the difference? It's the, you know, it looks the same. If yeah. you can get an excellent forgery, it look, but this is the same reason why people don't buy forgeries. And so, but it's because as a culture, we've accepted that that's the original and that's a forgery, right? And that's a, or a copy, even if it's an authorized copy. With NFTs, we basically are at the genesis really of a massive global cultural shift to the recognition of digital assets as being effectively the same as physical assets, you know, uh, you know, electrons versus atoms, basically. Um, wow. or, or rather wouldn't next say electrons, uh, bits and bytes versus atoms. Yeah. You know, and so we're in this like bit and byte economy 
where we're actually saying bits and bytes are no longer second class citizens to atoms. And everything is is on the same playing field. It's that like merging of traditional assets and you know digital assets and and NFTs is just that one way of doing it because we're all getting to that metaverse one day. And like, how would you would you describe it as something that is a world that can never be rewound? You know, fast forward, pause, and all the data is kept decentralized all over the world. So if you're buying land on it, you know you're actually holding that land yourself. Yeah. So that's the thing. I mean. Um, the metaverse is the sum total of all digital, uh, ownership, you know, that, that I think we're, that can be enforced through cryptographic yeah. proofs. That's the metaverse. And so what I mean by that is, look, Facebook can build their own world. They're not the metaverse, <laughs> the metaverse there, you know, they'll always be a subset of the metaverse. It's like you are, you know, your identity is a subset of who you are and people don't quite get that. So the metaverse exists already, you're saying? Well, let's let's delve into this quickly. Your identity is a subset of who you are. So you see yourself as Charlie Shrem, but you're more than your identity. And so your 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 psyche, your spirituality, your physicality, the identity given to you is a recognized identity by the US government, yeah, wherever yeah, yeah. it is. So that your identity is always a subset of of, of the whole of who you are. The metaverse is the same like facebook can create meta they're a part of the metaverse and a big player they can't you know they can't be the metaverse because the metaverse by definition is everything that's digital and where rights and ownership is enforced etc etc guys we need to talk about how to use your bitcoin and your usdc to earn you interest and make you more money to do that, we're going to talk about our newest sponsor, Ledin.io, a much better home for your Bitcoin. They're amazing. They're a secure, simple, and easy-to-use platform for managing and growing your digital wealth. On Ledin, you can earn interest on your Bitcoin and on your USDC with some of the industry's best rates. Earn 6.1% APY on your first two Bitcoin and 9% on all of your USDC. That's right, all you need to do is deposit your coins and you'll receive steady payouts at the end of each month just for leaving your coins with them. 6.1% on Bitcoin is pretty huge. You don't find that same kind of return elsewhere without taking a much greater risk. And 9% on your USDC? Think about what kind of rate you'll get if you had dollars sitting in your bank's savings account. Probably almost nothing. If you've got dollar savings sitting around, this seems like a no-brainer. All you need to do to sign up with Ledin is send a bit of Bitcoin or USDC their way and then sit back and let the interest accrue. So what are you waiting for? Go to untoldstories.link forward slash Ledin to start earning interest on your Bitcoin or USDC today. That's untoldstories.link forward slash Ledin. You're going to love them. Enjoy. Oh, that's such a brilliant thing to think about. And you have to have transportability interoperability mm -hmm. is it going to be like the web three is built on these rails of different blockchains and layers layer ones i mean how do we foresee this thing 10 years from now i'm trying to like wrap my head around the technology behind it and really the the value proposition too so i think this is a a, a banner year for nfts where a lot of the mints and stuff and the original stuff that comes out will be highly valued in a decade from now I mean, you just see crypto punks, etc. Really, you're at like any any yeah. NFT, basically that. Well, not like the stupid. So, ones, so let's start. Well, let's, experimental. Let's start with like uh, I'll use a good example. It would be you know crypto punks, hmm. right? Yeah. So crypto punks are valued at like I think the floor is like four hundred thousand dollars or five hundred thousand dollars right now in a crypto punk. There, uh, you know, there's a limited number of them, but there's an effectively unlimited number of social media accounts. Yeah. If Twitter and all these other services out there start. Um, validating these uh, images. If you want to, you know, oh, if you want to, if you want to flex, you know, there's only you know whatever ten thousand people that can have you know a certain uh, in a collection. They can have a certain image. So, like, I have a DJ ape as my um, yeah. as my my Twitter profile picture. Have there's only ten thousand apes up there, right? Yeah. So the moment Twitter says, "Hey, you can have an ape," and everyone can have a unique ape, there's only ten thousand of these apes out there. And what does that mean? That means that not everybody can afford to have one, even if they wanted one. And if for some reason this community is seen as a very cool community to be part of, people want to own it, they'll pay the rights to own the image and, you know, but the price will rise. And I think 
we we don't even we don't even have I would say we don't even have millions of of NFTs yet. Well, we probably have millions, but like pro, profile picture NFTs, maybe maybe a couple million. But there's billions of social media profiles out there, and billions of people online. So so if you want one of the original ones or one of the early ones in a couple of years when all these social media firms are busy validating profile pictures on, and even Twitter is doing the gallery as well. If you want to show that you know show off your your yeah. NFT gallery, you have to own those pieces of art or digitally. And wow. so, so it's it's like like Twitter is going to become like the Venice Beach of of digital art because when you go to my profile, you're gonna be like, Vinny's got a punk, Vinny's got an eight. Yeah. Got, wow, that's pretty cool, you know. And some people choose not to show it off. Some people choose to show it off. I mean, I just I'm gonna just have a cool profile picture. That's it. But um. Maybe I'll put some NFT art there, but it's not for like flexing value. But some people like to flex value. Some people like showing they're part of, uh, you know, Board Ape Yacht Club. Or right now, whatever. you can post CryptoPunk number one, you know, the most expensive one, mm -hmm. as your profile picture if you wanted to. But you can't but verify it. In So in the coming future, oh, you won't be able yeah. to, ver oh, so you, you can't right. verify it. And that's the next step. So Twitter's already announced this. They've already, shown the, they've already shown the demo videos of this. It works. They're going to verify profile pictures. So if and they will not be does. the first. They will not be the first. They will not be the only ones. But even if it was just Twitter. The whole metaverse. The whole metaverse will. Twitter your avatars. What does Twitter do? Um, well, they're not the only ones. The Web 3.0, yeah. the whole Web 3.0, as it talks, like all that data doesn't exist in one place. So like, yeah, if Twitter goes exactly. away or something, it's exactly. all kept everywhere. Yesterday we were watching Zed Run. You know, it's a, it's a, it's an NFT. I have, I have, a, I have, I have a horse. Oh, you have a horse? Yeah. We're, we're, we're watching a horse race. Yes, they're like it's watching. Great. It's great. It's fantastic. You can breed your own horses. You yeah. can, you can, you know, train them. You can do all these sorts of things with them. And it's and you're watching these horse races. People are earning jobs or economy, yeah. digital economy. And so, is this accurate with the metaverse? In the metaverse, you'll be able to yeah. take your horse and then potentially loan it out to someone in a different game potentially, yeah. or you know, you can have. Just it'll all be interoperable. It'll all it's come going to through. be. It's going to be. It's going to take time, but it's going to be interoperable. You're going to have bridges between between chains and whatever else. Your um your thesis at at MultiCoin is is kind of is kind of like making capital markets more efficient. How how do the capital markets come in here? Like liquidity pool borrowing against your horse is that you know people can fundraise to to buy not, like I just think of all these different possibilities. So, uh, like, my th my thoughts on this are. Yes, so DeFi was really a big play into into capital efficiency. However, you know, you still have other ways to do this as well. So, um, you know, I, I've seen pretty cool uh, NFT financing sort of uh, services yeah. out there. Um, I, I'm actually a big fan of what's going to happen in DAOs over the next five years. I think in five years' time, DAOs will be the biggest threat to the incumbents, banking world, whatever yeah. else, uh, because capital allocation decisions, uh, co-investment vehicles, uh, you know, this is going to disrupt Wall Street in a big, big way because, like, you'll be able to put your money into into DAOs. They'll also become very, like, exclusive groups of DAOs. So, and those exclusive groups, people want to get into. Like, would you want to get into a DAO with, like, you know, five it's or like ten a club. Top. Yeah, exactly. It's a decentralized so, 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 governance. So humans are taking everything. Humans are very fond of tribalism. We like forming tribes. And so we're gonna we're gonna basically form digital tribes over the next five years. In the metaverse, outside the metaverse, doesn't matter. It's gonna be crypto based, it'll be DAO based for sure. And there'll be a club where, hey, listen, here's a million dollars entry fee. Uh, you know, Vinny's in, Charlie's in, these other twenty five people are in. It's a DAO. Everyone has the same voting waiting. This is your entry fee to get into the club, and it's invite only. And once you're in, it's fully autonomous. We just we, we you know we vote on our phones or we oh we God. sign stuff and we agree on certain deals. And then people come to us. Like I had this cool idea. I'll throw it out there. Um, I had this cool idea for setting up a NFT buying club where you basically have you know a hundred thousand dollar buy-ins for maybe you know a hundred people yeah. or something like that. So. Um, so then you got like $10 million and every time an NFT launch happens, they go to the DAO and they apply. And I think like Flamingo DAO, there's something kind of similar, but you know, a little bit more exclusive and it's, you know, kind of an invite only DAO. And then new projects can approach the DAO. If the DAO gets a certain threshold, 66% or 75%, then we are guaranteed a thousand mints or whatever it is, or a hundred mints, uh, for each person, one per person or whatever the number is. And with that minting, you basically 
the project gets guaranteed revenue and it's a good signal indicator to other people that, hey, this sort of kind of elitist club DAO uh, people and these people who buy it are going to hold it. Like, you know, you know yeah. if our DAO gets it, we hold them for two, three years. It makes people feel comfortable that we're buying the NFT for long-term investment. It's good for them. So if someone created a, like a club like that, that would yeah. be pretty powerful and then be totally decentralized. There's a... There's an NFT conference going on, I think, in New York City in a week or two. Mm-hmm. So there'll probably be a lot of people doing doing things like that. How how do you have price discovery? So NFTs, the, the point of them is that they're they're non-fungible. There's one of one or whatever. There's like a one of a thousand pieces of, but they all have different attributes or whatever. But how do you have price discovery for them? How do you have borrowing against it and things like that? Still very new. It's still very early. I mean, there are sites that do it. I mean, you can borrow money against a punk, it's pretty liquid. Um oh, wow. Yeah, so they they decide to do it. Um, you know, the, the the problem with NFTs right now is it really serves a lot of the people who got in early. I think uh, it's it, always the problem with yeah, early technologies yeah, and, and distribution. And, exactly, and so a lot of the major wealth buildup is with early adopters, which is fine. I mean, yeah. it's not a bad thing. In, but, um, but like NFT, like I have this thesis on NFTs that the drops are going to become free. So that you're not actually paying, you maybe pay like a small amount, like 20 bucks, 50 bucks, some small amount, but the drops are going to become bigger and free. And these original drops that are happening this year, the past couple of years, they're going to be very valuable in the future because it's, you know, just kind of the, the provenance of it and the yeah. drops. But in the future, you're going to have these like 100,000, million, 5 million drops, totally free. And then these things trade in the aftermarket and that's where yeah. the, the creators get their fees through royalties. Now, why that's important is it's more about alignment of interests. If if the creators of an NFT project just want to like you know create it and then sell it and make you know millions and then yeah. go on to the next it's project, stupid. it's stupid. It doesn't give anyone any longevity, and then you know the whole project falls apart. But if they're like, look, this is our plan. This is what we're creating for the metaverse. We're creating these avatars. We're creating this um, different view of 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 reality, and you can own a piece of this, and it's you know it's free or whatever. Take one of these, uh, or mint one at a very low cost, or get it because you're part of another group or wh- whatever affinity group you have. But we make money on the transaction fees and the aftermarket trade, and that money gets used to enhance the community. So that actually is interesting. So you can do things yeah. like like there's a there's a group called Friends of Benefits in in Los Angeles, um, FWB dot help, and basically they got a social token, and a lot of what they're doing now is using the social token to create, uh, making a club that people want to be part of and you know, host parties and whatever else. So, so I think like social tokens are really, really interesting when you co-mingle what happens virtually with the real world. So what happens with Discord servers, but then you get together yeah. in the real world as well. Um, the, you know, th- These are the things I think is really cool because we're, again, goes back to my point, we're, under, we're, we're going through a massive cultural shift. It's like a renaissance in culture. Digital culture is yeah. now becoming you know, no longer second class. Do you see like the only thing that really hasn't happened yet if I, if, as I'm thinking about it is I don't really like pick up my phone and interact with crypto or NFTs or anything or really anything for that matter with another person or or in a place that I'm going unless I'm like, you know, using Apple Pay or I'm buying something or doing a, a financial transaction, buying something with Bitcoin or whatever. So, so if we have all these different like social coins and different NFTs is it more like we're interacting with people? That Pokemon Go is a big moment for the world yeah. when everyone was out in the parks running into trees, you know, playing Pokemon. Yeah. So so there's, there's two schools of thought here. One is that we're going to go into the Facebook world, the horizon where you're in this world all the time with your massive headset on, or even if they make it Ready easier. Player One like Re- style. Yeah, which I think, I think it's like, you, you know, maybe that's just like, Zuck's dream because he doesn't like people as much. I, I, I don't know. Like, I, I like being that social. That idea you is know? limited to like humanity's ability to think right now. Yeah. And we can't think beyond what our c- capacity gives us. So that one in a 10 million person or 10 billion person is that person who can think beyond current means. Yeah. And that's where we get to that next level. But uh, yeah, no, I agree. So, so, so let's, but let's, let's just break this down a bit. So there's, there's two paths forward. If, if you look at like, uh, digital integration to the real world. One is the Escape, Horizon, Facebook Meta, and all the other metaverses out there. Somnium Space is a, I actually like Somnium Space, and they're way more uh, they're way more advanced in sort of their thinking and technology than Facebook. But Facebook obviously a lot more resources, yeah. and so you know it's it's harder. Um, 
The other thing is the augmented reality play, which Apple and others are bringing out with augmented reality glasses where, you know, digital objects appear in the real world. And I think that's more likely to be a, the outcome. And Snapchat believes the same thing as well. Um, I think digital objects Google in the maps. real world, when you have a pair of glasses on, is probably more practical outcome for high volume usage than everyone sitting at home, ready play one with yeah. these headsets on. So we can maybe, be maybe like that's a... more like my bias because like I like that more than I like. I mean, I, I have an Oculus uh, Quest and I get on. It's okay. But like, I don't use it that often. And I just don't see myself using it. Maybe I'm just too old for this. But I don't see kids doing it either because kids also want to be social. I think, I, think, I think you're very right in that if we were sitting here talking in 2019, we may have a very different thesis on this. We may say we would have potentially said, oh, Ready Player One style, us sitting in our own homes. But we went through COVID. So there's, I'll, I'll add something to that. I think COVID helped us get a lot of insights. However, yes. however, the world, the Ready Player One world is, poss is possibly not that crazy. And Zuckerberg and Horizon may not be that crazy if we get lumped with another virus that's worse than COVID and we're back in our homes. And in the next two or three or five or 10 years, if this happens again, and it's like, we're all locked down, we're all at home, we're going to be all in this Facebook metaverse or whatever we want, we want to choose with headsets on and not socializing. And then it's okay because it solves the problem. And then you're going to get all the conspiracy theories saying, well, Zuck's the guy working on the next thing to get it. I mean, like, look. I just don't see humanity <laughs> over decades No, being but, but, but okay Charlie, with... Charlie, Charlie it's, it's, it's not about that. Like, we've got a taste of what a... And I, I personally think that, that it was engineered. I don't think it was yeah. a natural uh, virus. Uh, and, and I took the vaccine for a reason. He's like, if you're going to have a, like, my view was, look, it's probably engineered in a lab. And if you catch it, you have no idea what's going to do to your system. Yeah. And yes, the vaccine was engineered in a lab too. So you're going to get one way, you're either getting something, you're getting something engineered in a lab one way or the other. And I, quite frankly, I'd rather trust like, <laughs> yeah. I'd rather trust Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson yeah. & Johnson than some random unknown lab that engineered a virus. And so I took the vaccine. Because on a risk-adjusted basis, it seemed like a good idea, and I'm, I'm fine with it. But this is my point. Like, we were able to solve this problem and pr produce a vaccine in record time. Yeah. What happens in the next one is way worse and takes longer to do it, and people are stuck at home in full lockdown, and it transmits worse, and hospitals. Like, we've seen this happen before. I don't think anyone in a, in a clear, like, state of thought can say this will not happen again. Right. Like, you cannot possibly say to yourselves, never again will we go into lockdown. I'm sorry. It's just like, it's not. That's why I live in Florida. <laughs> well, you know, it could, like, free think, state. think of it. No, but even if it, even You're Florida. Right. What if you have to? Like, what, what if, if it's even something worse? where it's like, what worse? if it's worse? What if it's you like, have to any, be in your house? An Ebola yeah. version of COVID, where people yeah. are start dropping down and bleeding in front of you, and you just have to stay home. The sickness, as they used this, to call this, it. Yeah. 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 If that happens, it, and, and by the way, we it's very clear that these viruses can be engineered. So if someone engineers an even worse virus and the whole world, go, world goes in a panic, governments will lock down. We saw freaking, you know, the National Guard on the streets here in, in, yeah. in California during lockdown. Like they were driving up and down the street. Like this was going on, right? So like call me a little bit paranoid, but I think it's great that we have both paths, one being augmented reality for when things are okay and the other one being AR when for things are fucked. <laughs> We've, exactly. Fine. So we, but we've built our whole world around like us interacting with dozens and hundreds and thousands of people in big places, and we've built our governments around that. We've built our governments around so that's town exactly halls. It. You know, digital. What happens if we can't have town halls anymore? We will have it digitally. We'll have digital town halls. We'll have digital governments. And a centralized server. Well, not necessarily. I that's mean, that's my fear. We're, we're, so Web we're, we're RTC is pretty good. Um, there's lots of guys working. I mean, you know, you look at what's happening in. Look, we can decentralize it. I don't, yeah. think you, I don't think you can you can stamp out free speech online anymore. I mean, you've got to Filecoin is phenomenal. It's like, very optimistic. IPFS, I agree with you, yeah. IPFS is uncensorable. You cannot censor IPFS. And so Filecoin, IPFS are going to solve a lot of problems for us on censorship and, and decentralization. You're you're super bullish on Solana. Tell me tell me why. Because um, I'm always trying to keep my finger on the pulse and everything, and I'm mm. I've been studying it a lot. And I actually had we had them had them on the show, but um. It's super fast. So Solana is phenomenal on a number of different levels. They've solved, um, you know, so they solved for the fee problem, which is, you know, it's been an issue since 
Bitcoin day one. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, not I wouldn't say day one, but Bitcoin like 2017. Um, you know, and and the unwillingness to sort of focus on uh, throughput versus versus uh, cost uh, on Bitcoin has been a problem. Like like you know, one megabyte blocks. Sure, now I have to go to level two scaling, layer two scaling, and you know, it's taken years and years. And Solana has basically captured a whole different market. And Ethereum's had the same problem with gas fees as well. And so yes. Solana has really solved the sub one cent transaction fee problem elegantly. It works. It's fast. I use it all the time. Like you can send money from Coinbase to your what's Solana the wallet in like less than the, a minute. What's the trade off on the other side? Like what's the securitization? So the security is so. The, so the biggest criticism of Solana right now is the centralization. It's like you know, uh, basically the the validators that are running yeah. and and I mean it's one of those things when I'm in an Atoli. And we, we discussed it. It was very clear that you can get to like fully decentralized system at scale and, yeah. and it would take a while to it's get there. It's a path. There. It's been it's been live for like a year and a bit, year and a half. Yeah. Like, like people are just like Ethereum and Bitcoin are way more decentralized, sure, but they've been around for a decade. And they were centralized, built absolutely. Bitcoin. And so that's the thing. Exactly. Decentralization is a path. You have exactly. to have the tools built in. Exactly. So so it, I'd say it's reasonably decentralized right now where okay, good. you know like for, for for most of the value that gets transacted on solana right now there's absolutely zero incentivization for anyone to like yeah you know, behave badly at, at even at the current scale and probably even five or ten times the scale right now bitcoin you know it has to be decentralized i get it because yeah. you know billions and billions are being transacted on it every single day and it's a, it's a trusted network but it, you know, I don't think the battles between Solana and Bitcoin and Git, maybe one day, but not right now. It's between Solana and Ethereum, but I don't think it's a battle. I think it's like a coexistence. I think it's like Microsoft and Apple, where they coexist, serve different markets, different needs. Compete with each other. Compete with each other. You know, Solana is like ultra fast, cheap transactions. It's like the Microsoft way. It's a different, a uh, whole different language, it uses Rust, and you know, Ethereum uses Solidity. It attracts different investors. The one thing I will say is, so Ethereum's tool set is way more sophisticated and advanced because they've been around a lot longer and and there's more there's more developers on it, et cetera. But Solana is growing at a rapid pace. So, and the reason for that is developers in, in other parts of the world can't afford to use Ethereum. They can, yes. they can build on sort of maybe, layer, maybe layer twos, but they can't build on Ethereum as a layer one. It's $50 transaction fees for test transactions is just ridiculous. Like it's like the whole day salary. So they're all switching to Solana. You know, when we when I speak to developers out there, the only people who are still building on Ethereum are basically long-term Ethereum holders and people who have Ethereum and are vested in Ethereum ecosystem and want to keep their investment going. That makes perfect sense. Like, if you had a whole bunch of Ethereum, if you had millions of dollars of Ethereum as a developer, why would you build on Solana? Yeah. So here's the, the thing. Like, Ethereum is really good for the people, for the incumbents, people who have created wealth and they're sharing in the 500 you know, billion dollars of wealth creating Ethereum, and they're going to put all, uh, consensus and Joe Lubin. Yeah. Like they're going to put all their money and all their efforts back in Ethereum, and they're going to make it a better a chain and fix it up and do whatever they have to do, and it's great. And they've got the financial motivation to do it. You're never going to convince them to go. Bull. Like, why would you go work on Solana if you have no, no of piece course. of it? And you're going to so, have all these different competitions. So Solana has got fifty billion dollars plus in market cap, roughly right now. And that's created a lot of value. So a lot of developers who've got value out of that are now developing and trying to enhance the value there. The question is, can they accelerate the growth to a $500 billion chain faster than what Ethereum could do it, looking back historically, and create more wealth in that for developers who then double down and keep uh. building more? So there's this wealth effect that you get from developers making money out of owning a piece of the chain is what basically pulls more people in, more projects in, more thought leaders, more whatever. And so Ethereum has that 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 flywheel effect going. The question is, can can uh, can Solana do it? And the answer is absolutely yes, I think. Uh, I think Solana can definitely move faster. There's different applications that can be built, better applications that can be built, that cannot be built elsewhere. And if those applications take off, and things like Radium and Serum, that, that stuff can't be built on Ethereum. At what point does a blockchain move move on from that needing to like constantly having to uh, outpace itself or outpace its competitor. You look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin now it's great because it's survivability. It's growth depends on nothing happening. That's the whole point of it. Well, now. this is the problem with Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin for me just got boring after 2017. Like good, well, keep it in the safe, yeah, you know, yeah, leave it alone. exactly. Like I'm a builder and that's probably like part of the disagreement myself in the Bitcoin community was like, 
I like to build companies and products and yeah. things and utility and like the the, the 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 mantra was just hodl and we'll just like we'll just engineer this thing so it goes sky high because there's uh there's a, a huge market demand and then there's uh coins being taken off the market. Hey, it works until it doesn't work and Bitcoin's probably gonna go to a couple hundred thousand bucks pretty easy in this cycle. And it's not fun. Like making money for me is not that it's not as much fun as actually building stuff. I see stuff. what you're saying. Like I don't like I don't want to put the coins in a safe and leave them and forget about them. I want to build stuff. Timing is everything, right? Time is the most finite resource in the yeah. world we have. Yeah, exactly. So like I think blockchains for me, what captures my excitement about things like, you know, Solana, Filecoin, and Falcons are the new virtual machine and stuff. Like you can build really cool applications and that's fun. Um with Bitcoin, you have to rely on Lightning and you have to rely on the Bitcoin developers to build stuff that you know and and there's a community of people who want to do that now financially motivated to do that. They've created millions and billions of dollars for themselves. Great, go and do that. But like, it's just really hard building my, on Bitcoin. My and theory, I tried. I tried with Civic. No, no. My we, theory is that Bitcoin will become the the stable coin. Well, that's the that's the general consensus. But it's not going to be where all the fun stuff is. No, and it's fine because you don't want anything. You want yeah. it to just be rock solid. It's like we talked. I had a podcast guest and we had the last Fiat Domino. Is that um, mm -hmm. we talked about how the reason the dollar survived until this long is that there needs to be that one stable, that last domino that protects all the other dominoes from continuing to fall. So you need that one. And in, in crypto, we're going to need that one too. And absolutely. I think Bitcoin is, it's, I think it's critical for the crypto ecosystem that Bitcoin sits at a 40 to 50% mm. uh, Bitcoin dominance. I think it's super critical. If it goes below 40%, it's bubblish and looking bad. And if it goes above 50%, then, you know, alt's probably going to rally a bit. So, like, that's kind of the range right now I'm looking at. Um, and I, I think it's important that Bitcoin being the, the, the sort of major trading pair for, you know, most cryptos out there. And, you know, USDC is probably, in, you know, gaps on the market share. Yeah, um, I, I think it stabilizes the the ecosystem. So, and when I tell people coming into crypto, it's like, they ask, what do you buy? I said, look, you should probably just index to Bitcoin, first of all, the market cap. So buy 50% Bitcoin. And this is for people who are conservative, right? Oh, this if, is interesting. Yeah. Thought, yeah. If, if, you're, if you're a conservative coming in, want to get your, your beak wet, so to speak, put half the money in Bitcoin, put like 10% or 15% in Ethereum, then go and put the other 30% things like Filecoin, Solana, uh, I like render as well. And like, you know, whatever, like spread it around a couple of things sure. that you really like. Go for some Shiba Inus and yeah, meme yeah. stocks. Just and go have fun and play and build. Play and learn, right? And if you're really conservative, just buy Bitcoin. <laughs> okay. Uh, which is fine. If you really just want to have some crypto exposure. Or the futures ETF. <sighs> yeah. Oh, that's, another, that's a whole different discussion. <laughs> yeah, it's part three. Yeah. Vinny, thank you. I know you have to go. Thank you so much. Thanks. And 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 Nightbird Studios for having us today. And, and I really appreciate it. I can't wait till we do another show together. And happy Halloween. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun this weekend. This is fun. Thanks, Charlie. Good I to be here. I appreciate you. See you, man.